Election College, Episode 26, The Election of 1860. In this episode, Lincoln is elected and the Union breaks up. Let's throw a political party. Face it, the political scene sucks, but did it always? It's time for Election College, and class is in session. Now, your hosts, Jason Goff and Ben Smith. Hey everybody, I'm Ben Smith. I'm Jason Goff. And we want to thank you for joining us for another episode of Election College. Let's do this thing. So, uh, Jason. Yeah. You ever heard of James Buchanan? Yeah. Um, James like in Buchanan. the last episode we did, maybe? Uh-huh. Yeah, he was the president. Okay, yeah. So mm-hmm. that's about all we have to say about him. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, okay, we will go into a little bit more backstory because he's important, whether for better or for worse. James Buchanan started out as the Secretary of State. Well, he didn't start out that way. He started out as a baby. But eventually he became the Secretary of State. That and, is an awesome story, Ben. Yeah, I thought it was pretty good. If you remember at one point we did talk about how like if you were, if you were the Secretary of State, then you eventually became the president. Um we talked about that a long time ago. Well, that was true for a long time until Buchanan and then it was kind of the last one it happens to. Yeah, and get this Ben, nobody really liked him. <laughs> because <laughs> i mean he's a northerner mm-hmm. he's from pennsylvania and he strongly sympathizes with the south so bad bad idea yeah it's kind of crazy yeah. and he, i mean he's actually the only president to come from pennsylvania but when he was running for office he made really strong bold claims that he was going to bring the union back together and make sure the divisions were fixed yeah and it's kind of funny because well first of all he didn't do that <laughs> um, but it, it's funny because he almost didn't even run for the office. Uh, he basically had retired from politics in 1855 and said he was never going to take office again. But then people around him were begging him to run. There weren't enough people running that were qualified, I suppose you could say. And I mean, even in his inaugural address, he's like, okay, look, I said I wasn't going to do anything. I got <laughs> elected and I'm not going to run again. So don't even, don't even ask. Yeah, so he was sure that the Supreme Court would take care of all the territories and their disputes, right? Because that's what the Supreme Court does. I suppose, yeah. Yeah, and especially over slavery. And he said he would be supportive of whichever decision they came to. Yeah, and I mean, that that just wasn't true. <laughs> <laughs> we we start looking at the Dred Scott decision, and probably if you've never, if you don't even know what the Dred Scott decision is, you've probably at least heard the name, the Dred Scott decision. Uh, it's a it's commonly mentioned, uh, especially right now in the climate we're in and everything. But anyway, Dred Scott was this African American man who was a slave, and he had been taken by his owners to the north and still kept as a slave. And as you know, uh, hopefully we've taught you in the north. Most states, if not all in the North, depending on how you want to categorize, uh, were free states. And so Dred Scott's like, well, you took me to the North. You can't keep me as a slave. I'm suing you for my freedom. Yeah. So really the decision was over whether or not African Americans, slave or free, could be American citizens. And Congress decided that they had no power, basically, to outlaw slavery in any territories. So that kind of negated it being wrong for Scott's owners to take him to the North. And that made the South really happy and the North, not so much. Yeah. And essentially what that decision does is says, okay, so African-Americans, I guess they're not even really African-Americans. They're Africans. Uh, You're not citizens of the United States if you're a slave and therefore you cannot sue anyone let alone your owners or federal court or anything. So they're they're kind of saying we don't really know because he's not uh he's not a citizen and Buchanan's like, but could we just get like a firm yes or no? Could you just like make a statement? And they kind of went from there. So yeah, James, way to way to lead our country there. Yeah, absolutely. Uh so he goes to Robert Cooper Greer and he says 
just switch to the majority side and let's get a decision kicked out here. Yeah, so Greer joined the side of the South and not only ruled against Scott, but essentially made the Missouri Compromise of 1820 unconstitutional. Ouch. You can't do that, man. You can't do that. Yeah, so the decision was made only two days after Buchanan was inaugurated. (laughs) Nice start. Uh Uh-huh. That really upset a lot of people. Yeah, and you can imagine there were a lot of uh, conspiracy theories going around. He knew all this before he became president and had a hand in it, etc. Anyway, it, it definitely did not help the division between the Democrats and the Republicans. Things were really only getting worse and not only between the two parties, but between inside of the parties was kind of breaking up. Yeah. So you had fighting within the Democratic Party and it really caused the Republicans to be able to win a plurality in the House in 1858. So the Republicans, they're pretty much all against Buchanan and they block almost all the stuff he proposes and tries to pass, which just continues to make the divisions worse. Yeah. And Buchanan couldn't just leave well enough alone. And so kind of out of um, being retroactive on that, he vetoes six pieces of Republican legislation that had passed. And so Congress and the White House not getting along real well. Yeah. So it got so worse that the, the House actually created a committee in March of 1860 to investigate Buchanan, as well as his administration for offenses like bribery and extortion, among other things. And they were actually unable to impeach Buchanan, but they did find that he had attempted to bribe some members of Congress, and of course the Mm. Republicans, yeah, and some Democrats used this against him very heavily in the next presidential election. Yeah, I mean, you can't you can't just bribe people and expect them not to talk about it. Behind your back. <laughs> <laughs> Always make sure you trust people that you bribe. Yeah, make sure you trust people you bribe. It's that's really important. That's the, that is the tweetable lesson from this episode, ladies <laughs> and gentlemen. <laughs> Absolutely, definitely. So, uh, basically, what it comes down to all all this division in the Democratic Party really comes to a head during the 1860 National Convention. And so the Southern Wing of Democrats actually just get up and walk out of the convention and refuse to participate. Yeah, they nominate uh, the vice president, John C. Breckinridge uh, from Kentucky, to be the president since he more closely aligned with their beliefs. Right. And then another group of Democrats nominated John Bell, who was the former Speaker of the House. And they kind of liked Bell because he didn't really take a position on slavery. And all he said he wanted to do was an admirable thing was preserve the union uh, one way or another. He didn't really care which way it went. He just wanted the union to be preserved. So say what you want about that. But at least he was right in some part of it. Sure. (laughs) So so the rest of the Democrats, um, they nominated Stephen Douglas from Illinois um, for president. And he was still not terribly popular with James Buchanan at the time. Yeah, they're not real good friends. And on the other side of the fence, the Republicans, they had Honest Abe, Abraham Lincoln. Here we go. Are you ready for this? I I think we're ready for it. We're going to kind of dive in a little bit more. Um, uh, Old Honest Abe is a bit more of a current pop culture icon, a few books, a few movies, etc. So we're going to give a little more background on him than we'd normally do. And also just because he's interesting, um, regardless of your opinions on him. Uh, but uh, Honest Abe was born in a log cabin in 1809 in Kentucky. I wonder, like, there were probably a lot of people born in log cabins, right? Like, that's not just a special thing. Well, they had the Lincoln logs that the oh, cabins were built with, I think. Now I get it. Now I understand. Do we have to pay Lincoln Logs now? We actually we're actually sponsored by Lincoln Logs now. Oh, okay. Yeah, they're gonna pay us. Awesome. Yep. Thanks, guys. Really appreciate that. <laughs> <laughs> so Abe. He didn't like manual labor as a kid, and he liked to read. He liked writing. He was kind of a poetry buff, and he was mostly self educated. And as he grew a little older, he got romantically involved with a few different women, 
and even got pretty serious with a few of them. But eventually he got engaged to Mary Todd and everybody knows Mary Todd, right? I mean, yeah, on. yeah. They were initially going to get married in 1841 and Lincoln broke off the engagement. Uh, he couldn't handle her. And then uh, they met again later. They decide to get married and then Lincoln gets some anxiety and some second <laughs> thoughts and some, uh, some people asked him, what are you doing? Where are you going? And he says, to hell, I suppose. <laughs> and Mary Todd was just a troubled soul, um, as was Abe, um, as we'll find out later. So when Abe was 23, he bought a small general store, and it struggled. So he sold his part of it and began his political career by running for Illinois General Assembly. And he lost that election, but he was pretty popular uh, he didn't have any money, education, or powerful friends, though, so that didn't help. Yeah, it's hard to, hard, especially in in those days, if you don't come from a good family or something, and it's even worse probably now, I guess you could say. Um, but anyway, he became the postmaster, and then he became the county surveyor, and then, like all good future presidents, he became a lawyer. Of course, why not? <laughs> so after all this. He wins his second campaign in 1834 to the state legislature. He ran as a Whig, and he actually was elected to four terms. Yeah, kind of crazy. In the 1835-36 uh, session, he voted. This is kind of the beginning of the uh, whole voting and, and equal rights kind of things. Uh, he votes for white males to be able to vote whether or not they own land. And uh, he was kind of a big proponent of the free soil stance. Yeah, so after that, he served in the U.S. House of Representatives from 1847 to 1849, and he pledged only to serve one term. After this, he went and continued his law career. So then in the 1850s, he decides to get back into politics. He wants to oppose the expansion of slavery. Keep in mind, it was the expansion of slavery at this point, uh, further into the Western states. And he makes the speech in 1854 called, uh, or at least now it's called the Peoria speech. And he declares his opposition to slavery. So a couple different shifts he has. And he'd really talked about his opposition and especially his opposition to the expansion. Um, but this is kind of when he becomes known as the guy who publicly opposes slavery. Um, and, you know, talks about it. Yeah. So he ran for a Senate seat in 1854, but ultimately encouraged his supporters uh, to vote for someone else because he saw he had lost some support in key areas. So he still got the key votes in the areas around him. And just a, a little thing about that, then are you noticing a theme that we've got all these strong senators in this era, like year after year, decade after decade, we've got some pretty important senators yep. and they're not becoming president. Yeah, absolutely. It's uh like you said a couple episodes ago, kind of makes you wonder who are those people that uh, many years later will be known for how strong they were as um, other roles, but never became president or never, never achieved great fame in their day. Yeah. Mamas don't let your babies grow up to be <laughs> senators. Okay. Um. Yeah. <laughs> uh. So we know that. Later, Abe came in second at the 1856 Republican National Convention. So he's getting some traction at this point. He still can't get quite where he wants to be or needs to be to become, you know, the man we know him as of today. But he comes in second in, the, in 56, and he's doing pretty well at this point. Yeah. So in 1857, when the Supreme Court decision on Dred Scott came out, uh, Lincoln was sure to denounce it. And he even said it was part of a bigger conspiracy to support slavery. Um, sounds right. <laughs> he said that the quote, the authors of the Declaration of Independence never intended to say that we were all equal in color, size, intellect, moral developments, or social capacity, but they did consider all men were created equal, equal in certain unalienable rights among which are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Uh, some of the claims about Abe are that, yes, he was against slavery, and yes, he thought that um, black people should be treated fairly, but he was still a white white supremacist. 
uh, and he thought that um, the white white people were the better race. And some people use this quote of his to dig deep into that and and pull semantics out of it, perhaps. Um, I don't know, but it is an interesting study to see someone who was potentially uh, morally ambiguous, but at the same time did a lot of good for for everyone. Right. Um, yeah. So uh, we know about all those famous speeches that Abe Lincoln made, right? Like the Gettysburg Address. Of course. Yeah. Well, before that one, there was another one, and it was called the House Divided Speech. And after uh, he got nominated for Senate in 1858 by the Republican Party, um, he gave the speech, we all know it, a house divided against itself cannot stand. This government cannot endure permanently half slave and half free. I do not expect the union to be dissolved. I do not expect the house to fall, but I do expect it will cease to be divided. It will become all one thing or all the other. So he it was it's like almost like prophecy there. Yeah. Yeah. So next up, we've got the Lincoln Douglas debates, which most people are, are really no stranger to. Of course, Lincoln warned against expanding slavery and making it more socially acceptable, while Douglas continually emphasized that local settlers were free to choose whether or not to allow slavery. Yeah. And Jason, what was really amazing about those debates um, was not just that they happened. Like the, there weren't a lot of debates at this point in history, but the fact that they were not only happening, but that they were also drawing just thousands of people and crowds upon crowds. And, you know, we're in, we're in a day and age where you couldn't just put out a tweet that says we'll be debating tomorrow at two o'clock. Um, so it's hard to imagine that, that, such large crowds would come for debates. Can you imagine they didn't have election college back then? Man, I don't really even know how they coped most of the time. I I don't know either. Yeah. That hey guys, a lot of your friends don't know a lot about election college yet. <laughs> That's true. They're probably struggling right now. They are struggling. You, you need to go tell them about us. Yeah. And to join our happy community. Oh, we're talking about Lincoln and Douglas, right? <laughs> yeah. Yep. Absolutely. Okay. So Lincoln said that Douglas's theories were threats to the nation's morality. And Douglas said that Lincoln was defying the authority of the Supreme Court. So there's lots of nasty things being thrown around. Yeah. And in some sense, both of them were right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, yeah. for better or for worse, they're both kind of right. Uh, so in the end, Douglas <laughs> ends up getting reelected to the Senate. And, um, Lincoln loses, but what Lincoln does get out of it, I mean, like I said earlier, he, he's kind of fairly well known, but after these debates and the, the election, he's got all the fame he could want. Yeah. That's like Rob Bass, you know? I'm yeah. not internationally known, but I am known to rock on the microphone. <laughs> it's pr pretty much the exact same thing as Rob Bass. That's probably where he got his inspiration. Yeah. You mean Lincoln from Rob Bass? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, that makes sense. Yeah. So <laughs> soon after this, the Lincoln-Douglas debates, not Rob Bass. Yeah. Okay. So soon after this, Lincoln starts doing some touring and, and speeches, and most people don't think that he's very dignified or attractive. Uh, not attractive, at least, to be president. Now, I've seen some of our president's pictures and paintings and stuff. I don't, I mean, Lincoln wasn't a looker, but there were some ones that I think would definitely be considered worse. Yeah, I mean, yeah, yeah I thought, he's not a bad looking guy. Nah, especially after he grew that beard. Yeah, it's pretty tight. Every, everything's better with a beard. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> My son has a book called that, so. That's, that's really awesome. I just, yeah. we actually just got mugs from Goodwill of all places, and on, on the mug it says, beards. They grow on you. <laughs> that was terrible. <laughs> uh, the, uh, is it the terrible Illinois... that I'm drinking out of cups from Goodwill or? No, no. When you, when you said we actually just got mugs, I, I heard we actually just got mugged and I was like, why didn't you tell me about that before we started the show? But uh, I understand though. Yeah. The Illinois Republican convention came in May of 1860 and 
our boy Abe finally wins the nomination, and shortly thereafter, he wins in Chicago, and then he wins in Pennsylvania, and he is on his way to the election. Woohoo! Okay, we need to stop for just a moment. Okay. Okay, a lot of people liked Lincoln. Uh huh. Yeah, we know that. Yeah. yeah. Many of them in the North, and eh, there's a couple people in the South, right? Like two or three. Yeah. But he also had a good number of people on both sides of the line that were not particularly big fans. Mm. Yeah, you see, some people felt that he was too wishy-washy on the issue of slavery, and others thought that he just wasn't cut out for the job. At most points, like I said earlier, he said, yes, slavery shouldn't be expanded, but there were points where he wouldn't outright say the slavery that's already there should be abolished. And then the other people, like we said, just didn't think he was dignified. He was kind of a, from all accounts, a humble man and soft spoken when he did, when he didn't need to be loud spoken. And, um, people just thought he was too kind of unassuming for the job. Yeah. You know, Lincoln always doubted that there would be a civil war. Uh, he rejected the idea that his presidency could cause mass secession, even though there had been numerous reports of people stating that if he were elected, many states would start seceding from the Union. Yeah, and all those kind of threats and discussions got to the point where Buchanan had to address it in his final address to Congress, which that's not normally the thing you want to have to kind of deal with (laughs) on your way out of the highest office in the land, the dissolution of the country you run. He denied it was the state's rights to secede, and then in the same breath, pretty much, he said the government can't and won't prevent them from doing so. So both sides are like, dude, what the heck? Like (laughs) the the North is like, why aren't you going to stop it? And the South is like, why are you saying we can't? And he just, he doesn't, he can't win. He says a lot of stupid stuff. (laughs) Yeah. So meanwhile, Douglas and the other candidates uh, running for president were in full campaign mode and giving speeches. Uh, Lincoln wasn't. He relied heavily on the Republican Party to do its thing to win him the election. Yeah, absolutely. He's uh, he's up against John Breckinridge, Southern Democrat, John Bell, Constitutional Union, or I think that was kind of a division of the Whigs as well. Uh, Stephen Douglas, a Northern Democrat, and uh, probably lots of other people. But those are the kind of the four big ones. Yeah, and Abe isn't as popular as we seem to all remember him being. Even though he did win the plurality of the popular vote, it was just barely. The electoral vote, on the other hand, was won in a landslide. Yeah, he pretty much destroyed the electoral vote. Uh, So it kind of, once again, is a good good example of how it's not always about how many states you win, but which ones, and how many electoral votes they carry and everything. Yeah, you know what I think really won Lincoln the election? What's that? Hannibal Hamlin. Hannibal Hamlin? Yeah. Who the heck is Hannibal Hamlin? The Abe's running mate. Oh. Dude, the vice president. His vice president? Yeah. That's weird. We'll talk about him later, but I love this quote from James Buchanan. <laughs> when he was... So he's on his way out, right? Uh-huh. And... Lincoln's on his way in, and Buchanan goes, If you are as happy in entering the White House as I shall feel on returning to Wheatland, you are a happy man indeed. (laughs) Well, on that note, I think we will stop there so that next time we can talk about secession. Yeah, that's kind of a big deal. Kind of a doozy. So be sure to check us out on our different social media sources. We'll keep you informed as much as we can on everything. Seriously, everything, like even like stocks and stuff. No, that's not true. We're here uh, for you, though. <laughs> we'll sympathize with you. We'll, we'll say sorry about your stock. Yeah, sorry. Election College on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram. Type in Election College. You'll find us. Yeah, we're here for you. If you like what you hear, leave us a review on iTunes. It'll help us out. We appreciate it. Yeah. So... Anything else about the election of 1860? I think think that's all for now. All right. I'm Jason. And I'm Ben. We'll see you next time.